Well, it's two o'clock in the afternoon, boys and girls. You know what that means? It's time for another coffee break with Pastor Jim. Get your coffee, your Dr. Pepper, your Coca-Cola, your Starbucks latte, whatever you have to drink, and let's enjoy and let's drink that together and have a little break today. As you are well aware, I have my Dallas Cowboys mug full of coffee and ready to go here because there's no team like the Cowboys, and I think we can just all agree in the name of Jesus today and support those Cowboys. Eh, son las dos de la tarde, y como ustedes saben, esto implica que es hora para otro cafecito con el Pastor Jim. Tengo una mala noticia para todos ustedes que hablan español, que hoy vamos a hablar en puro inglés, pero de vez en cuando tenemos programación en puro español. Así que voy a seguir en inglés por esta vez. Today we're going to be completely in English. We have other days when we have completely programs that are completely in Spanish, but today, as you'll see in a minute, we're going to be interviewing in English. Uh, well, today we have a very special treat. We are going all the way to Minneapolis, Minnesota, and we're going to talk to Pastor Jim Halbert, the pastor of Fountain of Life Church in South Minneapolis, and he's bringing along his associate pastor, Calvin McIntyre. Welcome, guys. Hey, good to see you today. How you doing? Man, it's a great day. Down here, we're just, I don't know what the weather is there, but we're already boiling after the hurricane blew through. Now it's just hot again. Oh, wow. So I don't know what, what the deal is, how angry God is with us or what's going on here. But now <laughs> we jump out of a hurricane and now we're back in the oven. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> but Minneapolis has some of the most beautiful summers I've ever experienced. So you guys must be loving it. It's even been hot the few weeks here. Uh, probably, I would say, June. Uh, July, July has been probably a little in the 90s. A lot of, I would say over half the days were in the 90s, which is hot for us. For you guys, that's a, like, that's a fall break, I think, or something like that, right? Yeah, it's just the heat and the humidity, you know, and then you guys, of course, have the mosquitoes, but since we just had a hurricane, now we're going to get mosquitoes too. So it's like, we just can't catch a break. And of course, no lakes here. We have the ocean, but no lakes. So uh, you guys enjoy. I do remember, this has nothing to do with what we're talking about, but I do remember one summer I was in Minneapolis and my brother and I were in the water in one of your lakes and we just started hearing this horn go off and everybody disappeared. We're like, where'd everybody go? Like they, they kept blaring this horn and all of a sudden we were all by ourselves and the sky got really dark and I guess we didn't realize it was a tornado warning. <laughs> and we were the only goober still in the water. <laughs> so, so man, I guess you got to learn where you're at and what to do when you hear certain noises to me yeah. it's always the ice cream truck that's what i get excited about but <laughs> what are you gonna do well jim why don't you tell us a little bit about your church uh, and a little bit about how long you've been the pastor and what's going on there sure uh so this church here was uh founded in 1949 by pastor ray hansen and so it's been at the heart of minneapolis for south minneapolis for all those years uh, it's been a bible-based church and then I became the senior pastor in 02. Actually, I came here in 89, started working with inner city wow. team and uh, went to North Central Bible College at the time, North Central University, got my four year pastoral degree, graduated in 93. Uh, first, I did some college age ministry. Then I did the youth group all the way up until 2002. My youth group was a very diverse group, probably 50% African-American, uh, a lot of Native American, Asian, um, and really, I would say, 75% or more were people of color. And uh, it was, we were just family. You know, we were just doing youth ministry. We didn't know it had, couldn't be like that. It, it, it was just maybe something different than what a lot of uh, youth groups are like, but it was, yeah, we were just family. We were just uh, going, going toward Jesus. And, uh, and now uh, still to this day, uh, where our church is over 50% African-American um, and the, uh, you know, the camaraderie and the fellowship, uh, we just kind of lean in together each other, to each other in relationship. And, um, yeah, we're still a Bible-based church outreach. And, you know, the, the, the dynamic uh, and demographic of the city changes a lot with money uh, and what drives the economy and, and whatnot, so, uh, which is going to sometimes change uh, the demographic even of the church. But our church is pretty much maintained about the same demographic, I would say, uh, throughout. Um, but so anyway, yeah, so here we are uh, since 1949. So we're looking at about, what, 70 years or, or something like that? Oh, that's amazing. I mean, my grandfather was close friends with Hanson, and so was my dad. And 
and your church has supported our missionary organization for many, many years. In fact, we used to have mission conferences there every Thanksgiving. Yeah. And then, uh, and then I attended college at Northwestern University up there in Roseville. And the first couple of years I was in college, I attended the church there. And I think that's back when Pastor Hanson was one of his last years as pastor. And yep, then, so uh, yep. And then the fellow from Wisconsin, what was his name? Uh, Craig Jorgensen. Craig Jorgensen. Yeah, I was there for the first part of his ministry also. He played the piano, led worship yeah. and stuff. Yeah. And uh, yeah, those are the years I was there. And then, uh, and then, like I told you earlier, before we started recording, mm -hmm. our family stayed in the parsonage one summer before I went to college. And I played a lot of basketball in that park. We could walk to the park and played a lot of basketball there that summer and learn just how terrible I was at basketball. Man, that competition was unbelievable. I, what, what blew me away there at that park, the outdoor basketball, is the speed of the game. Like normally we play and you, you score and you just put the ball back in, you walk down the court. People never stopped running. Right. <laughs> never stopped running. I mean, it was exhausting, but it was so much fun. Uh, it yeah. was just a great summer there. Um, well, listen, we hear a lot of bad news from Minneapolis. Every time I, like I was telling you last night on Fox News, just a lot of bad news. Every time I turn on the TV, more bad news. So what I'm looking for, y'all, is just to tell us what's happening with the kingdom of God there. Give me some good news about how Jesus Christ is changing lives and what your church is up to there in town. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I'll, I can start, I suppose. You know, whenever there's adversity, I think that gives a, that always creates opportunities for uh, people to present Christ into those situations. Honestly, I really feel like God allows things like that to happen at times. So it does cause people to uh, take a chance to, or opportunity to step back and say, you know, where's God in this? And God's where he's always been. We know that he's still on the throne. He hasn't changed. And, you know, sometimes we can get about our affluent lifestyle and we can kind of, you know, feel like that's what life is really about. And sometimes really not have you know, what Minneapolis looks like, that's what a lot of people's spiritual lives look like. And so when this stuff happens, it can cause us to really try to figure out where are we really at with God? And how are we going to come alongside of people and let them know that God is, hasn't changed. He's still on the throne. In the midst of all this, uh, people look horizontal. And our challenge to people is always to look vertical. And because if people look horizontal, they're going to try to find their solutions horizontally. And what we're always trying to, you know, keep pointing people to Jesus, our, our solutions are vertical. You know, you can be in the middle of a pandemic and your solution is vertical. You can actually be a five-year-old child and, you know, have a great family, but your answer is still vertical. You can have a horrible family and be tossed around in the foster care system. And Jesus, your vertical answer in Jesus is still the same. And... So in all of this, I think as Christians, I think our challenge is always to make sure that we don't get sucked into the narrative that our solutions are horizontal, but always first and foremost that our, our answers and our solutions are always going to be Jesus. It's always going to be vertical. And it doesn't matter if Minneapolis is the most organized and, and, and Christian looking city in, in, in the world um, or the, the opposite of that. Um, our answer is still going to be the same and it's going to be Jesus. And throughout history. Uh, you can see cities that uh, seem to have revivals, some that, you know, are struggling. Uh, but the reality, it's, you know, Paul went from city to city. And every time we're studying the book of Acts right now, and sometimes he was more welcomed in some cities than other cities. That's, well, that's how the gospel is. And some cities were more tore up than other cities. And, and throughout our world, you know, we're, we're seeing the same thing. Now, Minneapolis is a hot uh, point right now obviously because of the murder of George Floyd, but in addition to that, just um, what's going on horizontally. And it's really all of a, it's all without Christ. You know, we're not going to find the answers politically. We're not going to find the answers and some of these other uh, ideas that, you know, get tossed around. And honestly, as Christians, we need to step up and we need to really love people and point people into the direction of Christ and, and really engage in meaningful conversations about Christ. Because I, I think even Christians sometimes, we get caught up into supporting our political views rather than uh, trying to point people to Jesus. Yes. And uh, then, cause you know, it's a lot of times it's kind of interesting because then Jesus gets lost in the whole conversation. And um, so I, I think that's been our challenge at church here is to just to always maintain point going vertical with people uh, where this 
with, with George Floyd's murder and what other things that are going on, you know, two people like me and uh, Pastor Calvin here sitting side by side, you know, a lot of that in the, in the, in the world, uh, it turns into a lot of arguing. It turns into a lot of finger pointing. It turns into a lot of bitterness. It turns into a lot of rage. And the reality is we need to come together and, and still point people to Christ because at the end of the day, everything that we're seeing here on this earth is going to be gone. It ain't, none of it's going to matter. It's going to matter how well me and him do this. Yes. It's going to matter how well me and him uh, show the love of Christ, not just to each other. Um, and his wife, Tammy's here as well. Um, a little peek at Tammy, the beautiful lady right there. Yep. <laughs> hey, Tammy. Hi. <laughs> but I mean, how well, you know, we do relationship, how well we show the world that, Hey, this is how you do it. So I think as a, as a church, you know, sometimes, you know, we haven't been very good at, you know, doing that. And so we got to lead in it. I mean, yes. uh, this is our responsibility. So anyway, so that's a little, you know, I, I give you a chance to answer, ask some more questions and kind of steer the conversation, but um, I, hopefully that could, gets us to start there. You said this was a three hour program, right? Yeah, well, it's, you know, it's sort of like Joe Rogan. We're just going to go until we get tired and have to go to the okay. bathroom. Um, well, we were just reading about Paul and Eutychus fell out the window. So we're, <laughs> don't, don't be sitting, anybody out there, don't be sitting by a window right now. I saw, I saw a Mark Twain quote yesterday that somebody sent me. Uh, Mark Twain, he said, uh, nobody gets saved after the first 20 minutes of a sermon. <laughs> uh, well, Kel Kelvin... Kelvin, tell me what God's doing there in South Minneapolis and how, how this has affected the church and how the church kind of has responded to what's going on. Well, um, I, I think that I can uh, just kind of piggybacking on what Pastor Jim said. Um, the senior staff here, we um, share Pastor Jim's uh, view that uh, God allows situations like this so that he can uh, show his love through the church. And so the church will have an opportunity to respond with God's love. And um, uh, kind of, uh, Pastor Jim kind of uh, set the, the groundwork in motion uh, from his uh, days as a youth pastor. He uh, created some inroads into this very community surrounding where, this, where that tragedy occurred. And uh, because of those inroads, he uh, established and has continued to uh, work with over the years, we were able to respond as a church. We've always been a church active in this community. And uh, because of those inroads, we were able to respond very quickly and, um, and respond with Christ's love and uh, respond as Christians and allow the community to see us out there visible so that they weren't just getting a political response. They weren't just hearing from uh, elected officials, they were getting the Christian response. And uh, so since that time, uh, God has actually opened up other avenues for us to minister, not only to this immediate community, but to uh, other communities with um, a message of reconciliation and um, open dialogue around issues that uh, affect all of us. Yeah, I mean, it's so important to talk and to be heard and then listen to somebody else talk and let them be heard. And you don't get that when everybody's screaming and shouting and yelling at each other. Uh, yes. I think that's awesome that you guys now I've, I've seen a video on Jim's Facebook page of you guys uh, serving food to people and doing things. What was that all about? Um, so initially when, I was out of town when, when the, uh, George Floyd was murdered that Monday night, and I was visiting my son in Indianapolis. And um, uh, actually, I didn't even know about it until Tuesday morning, honestly. And when I saw the footage, I realized that this is going to be a big deal. And then um, a bunch of pastors were going to meet down on that intersection for prayer at 5 o'clock. And I called our youth pastor and said, you know, he stays at the parsonage, actually, where you stayed for that one summer. And uh, typically, I usually try to have our youth pastors stay there so they're close to being able to just have the kids come over and a place to extra place to hang out with the kids. But anyways, I mentioned for him to go uh, try to get down there if he could. And um, but then that whole week uh, and he did. But then that whole week, it was very um, um, 
difficult um, because there was so much anger, so much, you know, rage. And um, so, yeah, very tense. So actually even that night, because uh, people went over to the precinct and he actually went to the precinct because I was still not back in town. I probably got back about seven or eight, but he was one of the first ones to speak over there, I think, in his trying to just de-escalate uh, the anger and, and try to get it refocused a little bit and and even trying to get in the way of people trying to damage the precinct that he almost was getting run over. And um, that he's a young African American guy, football player from Northwestern. He's probably been one of the probably one of their best running backs they've maybe ever had. And uh, so he's a he's a solid kid. And but they were kind of moving him around <laughs> a little bit. And he grew up in this neighborhood. And he grew up uh, two blocks from where this happened. So he's well aware, you know, of what's going on. And so anyway, our immediate response was, as a church, we need to be a voice in here bringing Jesus into this, into this dialogue, into this narrative. And uh, I felt like the pastors in the city kind of did the same. I think a lot of them uh, felt the same way is that uh, they weren't necessarily wanting to see um, all the things that, that happened. Uh, in, on top of that, everybody wanted to see change. Um, everybody never wanted to see this happen again. Um, and I know that, of, you know, for me as, as working in this African American, with African American community for so long, you know, when George Floyd, you know, was being suffocated, I think they all felt be themselves almost getting suffocated along with that. So as we were leaning into that, I, the answer to all that is obviously Jesus love, Jesus grace. And so we needed to come into the community. So anyway, that was kind of, that first week, I would go up to the intersection. There's a church right on the corner. We would support that church. We would bring supplies because then they initially were starting to serve food because people were coming there, but there's no, the, there's no food on the corner. And, um, and also as a church, it's a way to, obviously Jesus did a lot when he, he served food and spoke to people. That was very memorable times of ministry for him when he uh, you know, fed people. And so after that first week, I just kind of noticed that uh, there was that church was up there. There was another guy that was uh, serving food, and he had his gospel music cranked. It was filling the intersection fairly well. I mean, I just kind of saw, you know, this needs to be on the other side of this intersection as well. And I just felt the Lord just prompted me to say, you need to, you know, get up there. So we did the same thing. And so we um, started serving food. And because just the number of people that second week just, I, I, I don't know what I, I do. It was so many, but then we, we brought our, uh, music up there. We were just pumping gospel music into that intersection as well. I mean, it just the spirit of God needed to be there. And obviously with music, uh, especially gospel music, I think it really kind of helped. Uh, so it was coming in, it was almost like a stereo effect a little bit where it was coming from different angles, just, to kind of hopefully, uh, cause it gets loud and it not only gets loud, but it gets, uh, a lot of anger, you can sense it in the people, and then you get people that grab their megaphones and start talking, and um, and then, um, you know, you get the, the agitators. You got people that have no vested interest even in, they could care less about George Floyd, but they're trying to start, stir something up because they got other things and agendas. And so that intersection, I felt like it remained very, like a memorial site pretty much. And so we were serving food, praying with people, um, yes. people would come up with for food and it, it may, if I was there, like about every 10, we would stop. I'd pray with whoever's in line as far back as they could hear me. Uh, then we'd let those, the, the, then when the line kind of got up again, we'd pray again, pray individually with people. Um, and that was kind of our, our goal was to be, bring Jesus into that area. Cause I even heard somebody on one of the, cause there was another area where they had a microphone set up. It was kind of like an open mic. And somebody made some kind of comment from there. Where's the faith-based communities? And in my mind, I'm thinking, hey, they're here. I'm here. They're walking around, praying with people. And um, even Billy Graham had a group up there that was there walking around, praying with people. Um, and so we started that on the second, the, uh, we were really a week after. Because prior to that, we just didn't know how, what, we didn't know it was going to keep going like that. We had, nobody had any idea what was going to happen. And... So the, we did that for probably about 10 days. And then we took the second week. We didn't go Monday through Friday. 
that would, then we did again. So it would be like June 13th, 14th, if that's a Saturday, Sunday. Um, part of it is we didn't want to create a block party because after people are coming through to pay their respects and then it started really slowing down. And um, <clears throat> so we wanted to keep pointing people to Christ. And I, I think that the church was there and, but other than that, on that intersection, they were, I think it was trying to just keep it less with people out there and more where it was just um, like a memorial type setting. And there's, there's that conversation going a lot of different ways because there's a lot of dynamics that are happening as you're reading about. Uh, so some of the things that you're reading about is somewhat true uh, because there is a spiritual dynamic. That intersection has been one of the most chaotic intersections ever since I've been at this church. And that is been known throughout all of Minneapolis pretty much and I think it I think a lot of it resorts back to the principalities and powers I think there's things happening in the spiritual realm that Satan is trying to do to keep destruction and there's uh, that intersection is the intersection almost of territorial spirits or something I don't know if you you know how much people get into that I'm not trying to you know go too much down that road but uh it just to say that that was important for us as a church to be up there and and that was our, why we were serving food. We were serving probably 15 to 20 cases of hamburgers and hot dogs a day wow. a whole week. I remember we did our first day and I looked at the tab and it was probably seven to $800 just for one day. And I'm thinking, wow, I know we're supposed to be up here, but I don't know if we can do that. <laughs> um, wow. and there goes, there goes Kelvin's salary right there. Yeah, right. <laughs> His food budget. Yeah. His food budget. <laughs> So that was a challenge and we had, uh, but then we had other churches that looked at it as an opportunity to, for them to come alongside because they saw our videos and what we were doing. And um, so we had probably about four different church groups that came up and partnered with us. Well, man, it's, it's, it's just awesome that the church is getting involved and, and not just leaving it up to everybody else, but having a hand in it. Let me just ask you a couple more questions. I don't want to take your whole day here, but um I see in my notes here, Jim, that you're white, and, um, <laughs> and almost as white as this back behind. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, I'm not going to say I'm white, but mayonnaise burns my mouth when I eat sandwiches. Um, so uh, now you're working here, and you told me your church is about 50% African American. What, what's the secret to having a church like that, a cross cultural church? in a neighborhood like that? I mean, what's the secret of your success, everybody being able to worship and work together? Yeah, and I'm going to actually defer that to Pastor Calvin and Tammy. Uh, Great, yeah. Anybody that wants to all. answer that question, I'd love to hear it. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to um, defer that to Tammy to start out with. Yeah, this. I'll let my wife start out with yeah, that one. Good. We got it. And Lean, uh, in. Lean in just a little yeah. bit there. Am I in? Yes. Yeah, you're in. See, this is why. See, this is why I don't let my wife come on this program because nobody will ever want to hear me again. That's the problem. <laughs> it's probably going to blow you guys away at this point. Okay, Tammy. Hi. Go ahead. I would. I would say that the thing that has kept me here. I. I found this. This church in 1995, I believe. Wow. And uh, the thing that has kept me here was the call that God has in my life. And he clearly spoke to myself and Pastor Calvin that he has us here for the people. So we're here to feed the flock, teach the flock. And so we are, we'll be here until he moves us on to another assignment. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's, that's the draw for us is we are, we're working as unto the master. Right. Amen. And, um, to add to that, um, one thing that, that uh, has continued to keep me here as well, um, you know, Pastor Jim, I recognized uh, many years ago when he was still the youth pastor here, uh, I saw his heart, and um, my wife had begun attending this church regularly. I was a visitor, uh, and I hadn't begun attending regularly yet. But uh, Pastor Jim uh, was really committed to me and my walk. And when I saw that uh, he wasn't necessarily trying to draw me in as a member, but really committed more to my relationship with Christ, um, that really struck a note with me. And since that time, um, one of the things that's kept me here, and I believe it's had an impact on our membership, and it contributes to that dynamic that you're talking about, the uh, the um, demographic, uh, rather, 50% uh, black people, 
Um, as, uh, Pastor Jim really does have a heart for this community, and he has worked tirelessly uh, in this community, not just at the one of the local parks here, uh, and supporting the various teams and the children of this community. Um, he's been a participant uh, with helping to teach children at uh, the local schools, um, members of the local business community, uh, you know, know him by name. He walks down the street. I've walked down the street with them and, uh, you know, people are, you know, hey, Pastor Jim, you know, how you doing? And, you know, everybody knows him because he really is an integral member of this community and really gets out there and puts a lot of uh, sweat equity into this community and speaks for, um, you know, building up this community as well. And he participates on uh, various committees and so on and so forth to really see that this community um, uh, becomes healthy and, and remains healthy and also gets pointed towards Christ. Um, he was talking just a moment ago about various principalities and and we don't like to get you know too too mystical here, but um, but there is uh, there is an, a presence, um, and we do have to come against that. We do have an adversary, and I think I lost your audio there, Calvin. Um, there you with, go. With this church, come against that um, that presence, um, as he was saying. Uh, after uh, George Floyd was killed, there were a lot of voices active, um, a lot of anger, uh, a lot of political posturing, um, a lot of people um, jockeying for, to have their voices heard. Mm -hmm. And um, our main goal at that time was um, sort of a modern day loaves and fishes. We went up there with food because a lot of people came through um, while others were tearing up the, uh, the community, in other words, trying to subvert the infrastructure of the community, there were other people that were coming to the site to mourn and to, um, to really um, share their heart and try to understand and wrap their minds and hearts around what had happened here and how this could occur. And those are the people that we were trying to be responsive to uh, as a church. And uh, as Pastor Jim said, we were there uh, praying uh, with people and reaching out and trying to be responsive with the Christ. And that's the thing. That's the, the, the heart. Uh, the heart of this church is one of the things that has kept me here. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and it's why I'll remain here uh, as long as God has me rooted here. Mm -hmm. And I don't see my wife and I, we don't see ourselves going anywhere um, as long as God has us, has us rooted here. And this message is, is strong and continuing to point people towards him. Yeah, and, that's uh, great. Yeah, I appreciate that. I, I, had, I, had a, I was in a pastor's group the other day, and one of the pastors says that he said that if you're not reaching out to your community, you're a club. You're just a Christian club. If you have no impact in your community, you might have great teaching and great doctrine and great worship. But if you're not reaching your community, you're just a nice little Christian club for somebody to join. But you're yes. not really being a church. And so that's why I appreciate you guys looking from the outside in. It looks like you're having a huge impact on your community there and, uh, and really reaching a hurting. Because we hurt for you. I mean, we were hurting for you when that happened. We were horrified, and uh, we felt really bad for the community. And then when all the violence started, we felt worse. And uh, we just, I mean, Jesus just needs to be the Prince of Peace and bring healing and, yes. and reconciliation. I mean, it's just, we just want the best for Minneapolis. And, yes. uh, and we're really glad that you're there, super glad that you're there ministering and, and reaching out. Uh, now, I have a couple of uh, practical questions here. Um, does Jim preach hooping style since half your congregation is African-American? Does, does the organ play behind him? Not since COVID. <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear? He said not since, he said not since COVID. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> not, not through a mask. Uh, and he doesn't do any praise breaks or anything like that, right? There's none of that going on. 
<laughs> that was part of the agreement. I couldn't, they, they didn't want to see that, they said. <laughs> wow. The other question is, uh, now, Calvin, are you a Vikings fan? Um, actually, I was born in the South, and I was raised uh, in Wisconsin, so. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> so that means he's not sure. You can see that. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay. So, so, so you and the pastor are both Green Bay Packer fans. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to tell you. To this partnership. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So speaking of resentment, um, <laughs> the year that I thought the Cowboys had the best chance to win the Super Bowl I was in a hotel on my wife's birthday on South Padre Island. Our church is about 90 miles from South Padre Island. So we went to South Padre Island. It was my wife's birthday. I said, baby, I'll do anything you want, but I have to watch the Cowboys playoff game against the Packers. I just, I have to see it. So she took my daughter and they went to take pictures on the beach, came back moments after your quarterback jerked my heart out with a spoon. <laughs> yeah. I'm sitting on the floor devastated. And my daughter comes running in and says, are you ready to party, Dad? You ready to party? <laughs> I blame you both. I blame you both for ruining, for ruining my wife's birthday. <laughs> Man, no, I, I got to give Rogers props. I have hard, I've never seen a quarterback as talented as that guy. That guy's amazing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm, but, you know, one day you will come home to the Cowboys. You know, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe when Jesus comes back, you know, you'll come back into the fold. I know, they drafted somebody now. I think that though, that window of opportunity, I'm surprised they're not already talking about that. Okay, one more question, and then we'll go. What uh, If I was going to come to Minneapolis and I'd never been there before, where and, and there wasn't any COVID, where would you take me to eat? Oh, man. Oh. Well, there's a guy at our church that uh, he's like a pit master. We maybe would just swing by his house on a Saturday. Yes. <laughs> oh, now you're speaking yeah. my love language. There you he, go. He does, uh, we, we were doing um, a big rib uh, dinner thing every year as form of a, we called it a fundraiser for the kids, but it really was a friend raiser. It uh, caused us to want to uh, get, uh, you know, just bring people into the church and uh, people were inviting their friends. They were coming to pick up racks of ribs. We were going through probably about a hundred and, 30 uh, racks of ribs, and um, it was just, just from outside the church, just from people mm. that were kind of coming through, and uh, it was just kind of a fun event, but he's, a, he's top, uh, he'd be a top one, but as far as other restaurants, you know, there's, there's just so much diversity yes. in Minneapolis, yes. you could go to uh, a Middle Eastern and get some of the best Middle Eastern food, you could get barbecue, some of the best barbecue, yes. you could get um, a friend of mine, I mean, he was uh, Lebanese, so there was a, he'd love to go to uh, Middle Eastern. I guess that'd be more like a Middle Eastern yes. food. There's some great ones. They have good vegan uh, restaurants. Yeah. You said what? <laughs> <laughs> You're talking to somebody from Texas. She said vegan. She said yeah, vegan. Yeah, I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. I, I, if you read the if you read the story of the prodigal son, all right, the father is a symbol of God the Father. When that boy comes home. They kill the fatted calf and they have barbecue, baby. They eat meat. Preach. Preach. He, he, he didn't kill the fatted kale. You know what I mean? There was no vegetarianism going on there. That's true. No, I would say other than that, I mean, I think there's a lot of great um, uh, Mexican restaurants. Uh, you Pretty much every, whatever you like, you can find it here. Yes. Okay, well, now I'm about to cry. Now you're going to make me cry. Now I, now I got to get on a plane right now and head up. Uh, Can I just add one more thing? Um, Absolutely. An annual bike race um, every year, a marathon bike race. And uh, that gentleman uh, that Pastor Jim was talking about, his ribs are so good mm -hmm. that the rib master, that uh, during that bike race, our church has become an unofficial stop. Uh, <laughs> because of his ribs. Oh my! Yeah, but I mean, if you're on a bike race, you're gonna are you gonna stop and eat ribs? Well, it's a it's a 24 hour race, and they need to probably eat something during that 24 hours. And uh, that's my they, kind of bike race, right? Take your time. 
Well, you got probably a couple people. I don't know how many miles it is one time around. Yeah. But you know, some people might be stopping at every house, you know, so they might make it. <laughs> they might get. Wow. If it's a five, six mile <laughs> loop one time around, they might get around one time. You know, they're averaging maybe point point zero zero miles uh, per per hour. So I don't know. Well, the words of the Apostle Paul are echoing in my mind right now. I buffet my body and make it my slave. So yeah, I'm, I'm go. good to go. <laughs> we'll okay. We well, bef <laughs> well, before we go, why don't we uh, why don't we have you pray? Either one of y'all that wants to pray, let's just pray and pray for us and we'll pray for you and, and just pray for, uh, pray for our country yeah. so that God will heal our country and bring us back to Jesus more than anything. We just want to see an, another revival, people coming back to the Lord, another great awakening where people, hopefully all this hurting is going to bring us back to Jesus. That's my prayer that people will come back to Jesus and get all the hate out of their heart and all the racism out of their heart and just return to the Lord. That's, that's Amen. our prayer. Amen. All right. Well, here we go. Heavenly father, we just know that even at the, even uh, us sitting here today and even me and Pastor Calvin sitting here today, um, we speak against and renounce and reject any value that people base horizontal value on people uh, based on the color of their skin. Cause we know you created everyone with the color of the skin they had. You did that. And any judgment on that is really a judgment against you. And when people feel like they're, supreme or superior because of their color, their skin, Lord, we renounce and reject that thought. Uh, that's pride. That's not much different than Satan. I will rise above and I'll tell you, it's almost like Satan's trying to tell you, God, the value of the, of your creation. And we renounce and reject that idea. You are the sovereign authority over every living being that there is every color of skin that you've ever created to create in a, an amazing dynamic and mosaic of beauty. And uh, we receive that. We receive that everyone created in your image. We receive everyone of equal and of value because of what you did in our lives. And, and again, we ask that you help us dispel any of the ideas of, of the terminology of the they and the them, yes. uh, because it's us, that you created us, the human race, yes. in your image. And, uh, and Lord, uh, we're also asking that you would help us to be dispensers of love, dispensers of of these truths that that we are created in your image we are created equal and anything that is uh opposite of that that you give a special favor uh to holy to the holy spirit to uh speak into that to speak truth and the value of life that you put in each person yes. and we ask for the healing of our nation we know that satan loves to create uh people to come against each other for different reasons as we date back all the way to pain and abel and the amazing thing is sometimes that, that God, you don't do it for us. And this is a, where we have to step up and challenge and check our own hearts. Just like you told, told uh, Cain, sin's crouching at your door. What are you going to do about it? And that speaks into all of our lives, especially when it comes to racism and, and looking at people differently just because of the color of their skin. Sin's crouching at our door. What are we going to do about it? Yes. And uh, Lord, Lord, you're asking us to lean into one another and to come alongside each other, pray and agree each other with each other in the name of Jesus. Yes. Not any of these other bows and uh, horizontal agreements, but a vertical agreement in Jesus Christ that we are all uh, can be born again and, and made one in Christ. Yes. And that's what we're praying for, that kind of revival and renewal, not just in our country, but in the world. When the world looks at us now and says, what a mess, we're asking for a renewal and revival where yes. the world will look at us and say, what a miracle. Yes. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.